Well, good morning. It's me again from the announcement videos. Uh, I'm Dan. Hey, we are linking up with our West Seattle campus. Can we show some love for our West Seattle campus? So glad to have you here today. And you know, our West Seattle is just in such a beautiful neighborhood, but especially on days like this. I mean, it's nice here too, but I just love going out to West Seattle, close to the water. You can sell, smell that salt air. So you guys are lucky over there in West Seattle. We're so glad that you came to church today. Today we are uh, in a series uh, that you just saw in the, in the bumper video there called In This House. This is where we're talking about what makes up what we do, who we are as a church, uh, why we do what we do. And I don't know about you, but I get inspired about this kind of thing, right? Like talking about purpose, talking about motivation, talking about uh, insights as to why we do what we do. And not just in church, but in any area. I, this last uh, Friday, I was reminded of this in our family. Uh, I went out uh, with my son and my wife. We were out geocaching. Anybody ever been geocaching before? It's a lot of fun. If you don't know what this is, I understand the concept. There are, sounds weird, but there are currently millions of little boxes and cans and tins hidden all over the world. And they're in trails and parks and under bridges and, and culverts, and, and they're just there. And so you download this app, and it's a compass app, and it tells you where they are. And then you find it, and you write your name on the little paper inside. And a lot of times they have little prizes that you kind of trade, a little toy, take a toy and trade it in there as a little souvenir. My son is really into this right now. He loves it. He's nine years old. So Friday night, we went out geocaching, and we went to Carnation, Tolt McDonald Park, and they have a bunch of them there. And we tried to find this one, and we were looking for it for a long time, like 45 minutes we're looking for it. And we're on the wrong trail and it's like we had to hack through bushes. No, let's go around to another trail. And we were just going to go, let's just give up. Let's, we, it's getting dark. It's getting cold. We're getting bit by mosquitoes now. And so my son and I were like, yeah, let's give up. But my wife was like, come on, guys, we can do this, right? And we just kind of were reminded, yeah, we're not quitters, right? We're materials. This is what we're about. We don't give up. We get the job done. We finish. We push through. And we kind of did a little like rally go team and we found the geocache. And, we, and because we pushed through inside, we got this little hand finger puppet. I don't know if you can see this. It's a, it's a, it's a hand that goes on your finger. Look at this. We would have never found this. It, I'll put, this is creeping some of you out. So I'm going to put that away. But it was just one of these moments and we kind of drove home with a different like expression, a different emotion, a different look on our face because we didn't give up. We did it, right? You know, we do give up on some things. But that night we didn't give up because as it was like, this is what we're about. And this is kind of the, the, the emotion, the, the purpose of this series is that this summer we would gather together as a church and put something on the table and go, Eastridge, this is us. This is what we do. This is who we are and this is why we do it. Come on, ready, set, go. Let's do it. Let's get it done. And I love this kind of thing. Are you with me on that? Yeah, yeah come on. So we're, right now we're in a, uh, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things this summer that we do, but we're in a, a, a three-pronged approach to ministry that we have done for decades since Pastor Steve came here 20 years ago. It's called Outreach Embrace Disciple. That's our three pronged approach to ministry. That's how we do ministry. We reach out, we embrace, we disciple. Last week, Pastor Larry talked about discipleship, about growing in faith with one another, encouraging one another, sharpening one another to grow in faith and knowledge of God's word. Today, we're talking about the second part of that, the embracing ministry of Eastridge. Now, that's not the hugging ministry of Easter. It's not that kind of embracing, although that might be part of it. Although you don't, you're not required to hug in order to be here. That's optional. But the embracing, we mean uh, connecting in relationships, joining together with one another, embracing in God's love. And that's what we're about here at Eastridge Church. Now, uh, as a, uh, a Northwest native, and a member of, and a pastor of a church that values embracing, I'm very aware of a phenomenon that we have in the Northwest called the Seattle Freeze. 
Do you know what the Seattle freeze is? This has been documented in several articles and kind of anecdotally lots of times, but that's the idea of how people are in the Northwest. We are polite, but not friendly. That's what the Seattle freeze says, that we will stop and let you cross the street in front of us for the crosswalk, but you're not getting invited to the party, all right? And there's no way you're going to come over to our house. And some of you who are here from like Southern hospitality states or the upper Midwest, nice, you're like, yes, that is exactly how you are. Maybe it's harder for me to say, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm a native here. I've always lived here. But there's a lot, story after story of people who move here and feel like there's a barrier. I just can't break through in relationship with these people. They seem nice. They smile at me. They're, they're happy to see me. But then I they don't have any plans on the weekends because I can't break through with these people. The Pemco Insurance just did a, a, a new survey on this and found that Northwest natives, almost 40% of people in the Northwest said they have no interest in making new friends. That they're, they're just like, nope, I'm good. And 49% of people in, in the Northwest said, I have no interest in talking to someone that I don't already have a relationship with. Half of people said, if I don't know them, I'm not going to talk to them. That's a tough climate to build relationship in. Isn't that right? But even so, we have a need for connectedness. Even so, and I think even more so in a neighborhood and a climate where we kind of just push the garage door open, go in and never talk to our neighbors, we have a need for connectedness. I had a, 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 an encounter with this need this week as I went to a gas station paying in cash because I took Financial Peace University and Dave Ramsey says deal in cash. So I, it's a pain at the gas station though because you have to go in. And so I said to the lady, can I get $30 on number one? And the lady lit up and went, where are you from? <laughs> and I said, uh, Sammamish? And this is gas station right here by Lake Sammamish State Park. And she goes, no, no, no. Like, like where are you from? Because I'm from Texas. And I said, I'm from Kirkland. Uh, I, and she goes, you never lived in the South? I said, well, I went to California on vacation. Is that? Oh, she was like so deflated because she thought I was from Texas. And she sat there so disappointed because she didn't have anybody, any connection for a fellow Texan. And I walked away confused because I somehow have a Southern accent. I'm not sure like what she thought actually as I thought about it, I don't think I, do I have a Southern accent? No, I don't have a Southern accent. And I only said one sentence. I said, can I have $30 on number one? I don't know what she heard. I think it's because I was smiling and wearing a button up shirt. And she was like, that guy must be from out of town. He's from the South. Look, he's smiling. Uh, and maybe that was it. But she was, she wanted this connection. We all have a need for connection, don't we? And, and even if uh, we find it in unpredictable or maybe mysterious ways, we have a need for connection. I listened to another article on the radio that talked about the rise of what they called cult brands, not religious cults, but like brands that have a unique style or a unique personality like Harley Davidson, right? People are loyally devoted to Harley Davidson. But then they said these weirder ones, like they had a story of a guy who was just loyally dedicated to Southwest Airlines. That was his thing. He's like, I love, I don't go anywhere the Southwest doesn't fly or, or, or Trader Joe's. That's my, that's my brand. And people are getting Trader Joe's tattooed on their skin because they're fiercely loyal to a brand. And I thought this was fascinating that the, the psychiatrist uh, said as to why people feel this way about grocery stores and, and automobiles and just brands. She said, people want to belong to something. I thought, that's so true. We all want to belong to something and we're grabbing at something to belong to, something to connect to. And as we talk about in this house, the embracing ministry of Eastridge, it might be easy to think, oh yeah, you know, that's good. People want to connect to something. So we should be a place they can connect because then we can be a successful church and that will give people what they want. But that's not it. That's an upside down way to think about it. See, what I believe is that there's a desire that God put in every single person to connect to him, that he put a desire in everyone, whether they know him or not, to connect with their father, connect with their creator. And we, the church, are the body of Christ. 
And what is the body of Christ? It's a living organism that's the tangible representation of Jesus on earth. Therefore, there's a God-given desire for everybody, whether they know it or not, to connect with the church, to be a part of the church because it's the body of Christ. It's the love of Jesus. It's what they really want. And when they join a Harley club or they get a Trader Joe's tattoo, what they're really doing is grasping at some kind of connectedness when they really want is connecting to the church. Now, it might sound like a really self-centered idea, like, oh yeah, everybody wants to be a part of us because we're so great. But it's actually a very humbling idea because this idea that we're the physical representation, the tangible representation of Jesus is both what we are and what we strive to be because we can do it not very well, can't we? And some churches are right now doing it not very well, right? We have a, a, a job to do to be the thing that people are searching for, that connection to God through the body of Christ. So how do we do that? That's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna open the scripture here in a minute, but would you join me in prayer just as we uh, ask for God to, to teach us and speak to us, his spirit minister to us today as we open his word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your uh, grace, your, your sacrifice on the cross, and Holy Spirit, we pray that today uh, you would be with us, minister to us, give us wisdom, comfort as we open your word. I pray, God, that you would guide us uh, to good things, that you would help shape us and mold us, help Eastridge Church be all that, it, uh, that you want it to be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look today at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, and I think it's interesting to point this out. We just received communion together, and I read from uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, and, and so we're just kind of one page over on this because this book, 1 Corinthians, was written by Paul to the church in the city, Corinth, uh, and, and it kind of was written to address different um, problems that were going on. And one of the problems that was going on was that people were dividing up to eat communion, the me communion meal. So the, the kind of richer people, the more well-off people, the more popular people were getting together early, eating and drinking everything. And then the lesser, the people who had less, the people who were kind of less valued in the society were showing up and there was nothing left to eat. And so Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, that's not how it should be. Here's how Jesus taught us to do it. Eat this bread, drink this cup, do it together. There shouldn't be any division among you. Also, there were uh, divisions like in Corinth, people were saying, well, you know what? We follow this teacher. We follow Apollos. And these, we're loyal to Paul. And these people say, we listen to Peter. So Paul's saying, that's not how it works. We're one church. We're one united body. And he talks about this idea of the church being the body of Christ. And it's a powerful metaphor because he just got done talking about the bread and the cup being the body and blood of Jesus, representing the body and blood of Jesus. So now he says, that's us, you guys. We are united as one body. And the eye shouldn't look at the ear and say, I'm better than you or you're better than me. And the hand can't look at the foot and say, I'm more valuable than you because the body is one. Everything is united together. So let's look here at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 24. It says, God has put the parts together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. So here Paul is saying, not only is the church made up of lots of different members and parts, and that we should care for one another, but there's a connectedness between each of the parts, which is true for the body, right? If the parts of a body weren't connected, it wouldn't be a body. It would be some kind of like, you know, I don't know, monstrosity or something. You know, it's just not good if pieces of a body aren't connected. It's not a body unless there's connectedness between the body. And here Paul is saying, come on, guys, that's why we should behave. In fact, there should be no division among you. And he does this kind of uh, play on words that we miss in English. But he says, you know, there should be no division. And the word is schisma, which is like a tear or a rip. There should be no like tears between you, but there should be equal concern between you. And that word equal concern means we should be worried about each other. We should be anxious for each other, right? Usually that's a negative thing in the Bible. We shouldn't be anxious, but here it says you should be anxious for each other. But the literal term that he's using there means we should be, we should feel broken apart 
about each other. We should feel maybe it would be like the English ter term uh, torn to pieces or, or you know, uh, in pieces or, or something that we feel if we're separated from each other, we're not whole, that there's a piece missing that just like a body would feel if one part is pulled away, if you have a dislocated shoulder, the whole body is worried about that, right? Because a part is not right. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now we're in an individualized culture here in America and it can be easy for us in the church or uh, others in the church to say, okay, great. I'm going to read here 1 Corinthians 12. Looks like we're all part of the body. I have a role. You have a role. So I'm going to do my role. You do your role. We'll compare notes in heaven, right? That's probably because I don't have to worry about that. But that's missing the point to think like that. Because God, uh, that Paul is saying here that, that God is wanting us to not just serve a part in the body and be a part in the body, but to be connected. That's the point, that there should be an interconnectedness because we are not the body of Christ on our own. We're the body of Christ together. And throughout history, the church has struggled with this, being a part, being connected, uh, and in these divisions and factions, and there's been a shortcut that the church has been guilty of uh, kind of throughout all of its history. And the shortcut kind of goes like this. All right, the Bible says there should be no divisions in the church, that we all need to be connected. So why don't we have kind of a screening process so that only people who are like us get into the church. That'll make it a lot easier. We won't have to worry about divisions as much. So, so uh, sometimes this is done out loud, sometimes just subconsciously, but, but the, uh, the pattern of belonging in the church goes like this, that first you behave a certain way, and if you behave that way, then you can believe what we believe. We'll kind of let you into that club. And if you behave a certain way, not just in morality, but even in your culture and your customs, and then you believe just like we believe, whether it's in the Bible or not, you agree with what we believe, then you can belong to the church. And that'll make it a lot easier, right? And this has been the church's go-to for a long time in some situations, but there's a problem with this. It's not what Jesus taught us at all. The church is not supposed to be somewhere where first we behave a certain way, then we believe, and then we belong. Instead, Jesus gave us a different way because there's a problem with this. In fact, there's several problems with this. Believing this way is poisonous, because it reinforces some very uh, unhealthy ideas. First, it reinforces this idea that we can change our behavior on our own, that we in our own strength can pull our life together, get rid of all the garbage, put our life on the right track, get uh, uh, worthy of God's grace so that we can step in and go, okay, I cleaned myself up. Now, Jesus, I'm ready to put faith in you. That's totally not true. We cannot put our life together on our own. We need God's grace to do that. And when we say, first, you need to behave a certain way before you can believe in Jesus, that reinforces the idea that I'm the one who changed me and I'm not the one who changed me. It's only the Holy Spirit who changes us. Second, it reinforces this idea that God only loves and accepts people who have their act together. And I'm so thankful that's not true because I don't have my act together and you don't have your act together. Without God's grace, none of us have our act together. And third, it reinforces the idea that once you've been accepted into the church, once you belong, you're done. You're finished. You don't have any more work to do. You don't have to keep growing. You don't have to keep examining your thoughts, attitudes, motives, and actions. And you're tenured in the church, so everybody's just going to have to deal with you and your attitude because you're here and you're the one who decides how things are going to be, right? All of those are poisonous ideas that are just contrary to the gospel of Jesus. In fact, Jesus gave us completely the opposite model that first we belong. First, we belong in relationship. First, we connect to Jesus and to the church in relationship. Second, then once we belong, then we believe, then we behave. Look, look at how uh, Jesus puts it in, in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, this is a story of Jesus going to uh, the tax collector's booth. As Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me. 
he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but for sinners. What did Jesus require of Matthew before engaging him in relationship? Nothing. He didn't require anything of him except that to say, Matthew, will you accept my invitation to relationship? Uh, Jesus gave Matthew and the other tax collectors and sinners the opportunity to belong before they even believed in him, before they had their stuff together, before they pulled all the sin and garbage out of their life. First, he said, I want to have relationship with you. I want to connect with you. It's often said that Uh, Christianity is not about religion, it's about relationship. Have you heard that before? Do you believe that? Absolutely. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. But here's something that is often missed in that. Christianity is about relationship with Jesus, but it's also about relationship with you and with me and with each other. Because we are, look at what 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We as a body of Christ, we have a role in this. And we're not off the hook to be able to say, you know what, it's not about religion, it's about relationships. So go have a relationship with Jesus. I hope that goes well. Jesus has bid us to say, no, you're the body of Christ. Yes, salvation comes through his sacrifice on the cross. There's nothing you or I can do to save anybody. But we are called to be his ambassador, to be his representative, to be the one that people connect with in that relationship, to connect with Jesus in relationship. At Eastridge, this is who we are. And this is who we strive to be. (laughs) Excuse me. We want to be an embracing church. We want to be a church that embraces in relationship. And that's why we toil over creating opportunities to connect. You know, we do a lot as a church. We do a lot as a church. I don't know if you've gone to other churches. Not every church does this much. We do a lot as a church because we want to be a church that offers so many places to connect that no matter who you are, you have a place that you can make a friend. You can have a conversation. You can have a a relationship. We want to be like Velcro and just have hooks all over the place so that when someone comes here, they go, I belong because we're an embracing church. That's who we want to be. That's how we do things like celebrate recovery, where you can come and belong no matter what your hurt, habit, or hang up is. That's why we do things like savor the season, where we just invited hundreds of ladies just to come here and decorate a table all real big. And and for a long time, I didn't get it. But then I went, okay, I get it. These ladies are connecting in relationship. They're enjoying an evening together and belonging here. That's why we do couples nights out, painting canvases and having Valentine's dinners together. It's why we do Youth Invite Nights and VBS and Fall Festival and a dozens of other things that we do. It's not just to fill the calendar, it's to be an embracing church, to have somewhere where somebody can come in, invite a friend, invite a neighbor, to come in, have a conversation, have a relationship, and just through interaction feel that they belong. Even before they believe, even before they feel worthy enough to come through the doors here on a Sunday morning, but to come to church, to just come and connect because that's who we are. We're an embracing church and that's who we want to be. That's why things uh, like Alpha have been so successful. You don't know about Alpha. This is a place where people can come and explore their faith in a conversation, even if they're asking questions, even if they don't even know if they believe there is a God, to be able to have a conversation because the conversation builds relationship. And people can get to that place where they believe because they feel like they're heard, because they feel like they belong, because they feel like they're loved. And that's the body of Christ, is expressing the love of Jesus. This is why we do life groups. Pastor Larry talked last week about discipleship, how we grow best when we grow together. 
Life groups are a place where we study the Bible together, where we pray together. But you know what? If you look at our, our summer life group catalog, and I encourage you to do so, you can grab one on the way out today. Uh, there are a ton of groups where they're just, we're just playing together, right? I went yesterday to Janelle Murphy's Eastridge Running Group, and we just ran for 40 minutes. It was awesome. We prayed at the end, but we just ran together. It was great. Today, I'm going to go to Derek Dutilly's Ultimate Frisbee Group. Today at 2 o'clock, you can come too. We're going to play Ultimate Frisbee. It's going to be awesome, but it's going to be very little studying the Bible. Actually, no studying the Bible. We're going to pray together and a lot of having fun together. Tomorrow, I'm going to, uh, to Michael Larson's Taco Truck men's group, right? Because we're just going to have fun together. I've got an addiction. I know I'm going to groups every day, but I love it. I love it because I love to have these connections and I love meeting with other people because when we meet together, it's the body of Christ. And when Christians meet together, God's there with them. And when God's with us, things change. People change. The Holy Spirit works and grows, even if we're just sitting around eating tacos together or playing ultimate Frisbee. That's why we want to invite you to be a part of a life group. Our groups, our summer groups are already started, but I just thought we should open up signups again just to say, hey, if you've not connected in relationship through a group, connect today. You can sign up today. You can go online right now, easterstoday.com slash groups or sign up on the way out today. Connect through a group because that's relationship. That's connectedness. We're uh, doing uh, something we've never done before. It starts next week. We're doing the Eastridge Softball League. How many are signed up for softball? Yes, we have 88 people signed up for a softball league right now. So that's eight teams. We'd love to add a few more so we could have some subs and extras. But all this is is eight teams from Eastridge playing other teams from Eastridge. And the idea for this came out of how can we encourage people to engage in relationship who so far have been unwilling to engage, either because they feel like they don't have time or you know, church groups is not really their thing, or maybe they don't, you know, they, they, they don't feel like, oh, what would I do? But they would join a softball team. So we just try to remove all the barriers, put it on Sunday nights where people, uh, you know, we have a, a park for kids can play. It made it 25 bucks for the whole season. Just remove all the barriers so people can just play. In fact, we said, hey, if you've got a friend who doesn't go to Eastridge, a coworker, a family member, just give them this promo code. We'll register them for free because we want to be a place to connect. And it's going to be an awesome, awesome thing. Think about this. There's going to be 88 people who are going to play together from Eastridge, who are going to win together. They're going to lose together. 88 people are going to have at least 10 friends now that they've been on a team with so that we can connect in a way that speaks to people's belonging. It's going to start next week. If you want to be a part of this, you can do it too. Go to eastridgetoday.com slash groups. You can sign up right now. I took my phone out of my pocket so I wouldn't keep getting the email notifications while I'm trying to preach. You can sign up on the way out today. Uh, but this is a place where you can connect. Something we've done for the last two years. It's called Dinner Together. We're going to be doing that again this year. This is really simple. All you do is if you want to host a dinner together, you say, hey, August 2nd, whatever date I pick, I'm going to host a dinner at my house. We get six or eight people who live in your neighborhood, send them over to your house for dinner. They bring something, everybody shares a meal together and you have a great time. I can't believe the relationships that I've built with people through one 90 minute dinner. It's amazing. It's powerful. It's powerful. And it's modeled by Jesus. Why did Jesus in that passage we just read, why did he go over to Matthew's house for dinner? Was it because Jesus was really, really hungry and he needed dinner? Probably not, right? He went over to dinner because it's fun to, to, to have dinner together. It's enjoyable. Pastor Steve often refers to me as the pastor of fun. Have you heard him talk to me about that? Yeah, I am the pastor of fun. Now, he doesn't call me the pastor of fun because I have interesting hobbies and I like to eat tacos, right? That's just extra. He calls me the pastor of fun because we at Eastridge value this and he's tasked me with leading that effort to connect people in a way that's enjoyable for one another because when we're having a good time together, we're belonging. And when we're belonging, we're reflecting the, the pattern and the love of Jesus. All of these things I talked about here are just to kind of cast vision for you as to who we are and what we do as a church. I don't want to be a, a commercial sermon here today, but I want to encourage you with one last thing. As you hear me talk about these things, and maybe you hear these things all the time, I want to encourage you not just to think about things that we do here at Eastridge, whether it be events, or whether it be a VBS or serving as a volunteer or connecting, hosting a dinner, playing softball. 
I want to encourage you not just to think about those to say, do I want to go to that? Does that sound like fun for me? Is that enjoyable for me? But to think about it this way, could God use me in that situation to bless someone else? If I'm a part of that, could God be a conduit of blessing for me that maybe it's not me who receives the blessing, but me who delivers the blessing to someone else? Because we're the body of Christ and the body of Christ is about connection. The body of Christ is about concern for one another, not just concern for one another, but being anxious over one another. Feeling like if I'm disconnected, I'm losing and the whole body is losing too because we've got to have a connection like a body would have. Now, as we talk about this idea of belonging, I want to reinforce this. Belonging is not where it ends. Belonging is not the end of it because the believing and the behaving, those are necessary parts of the process. It's just that we belong first. You're not going to be saved by going to a dinner at somebody's house. In fact, you could go to all the dinners. You're not going to be saved. If you go to all the softball games, that's not enough. We need to put faith in Jesus. It's just that when we belong first, we know who we're having a relationship with. We belong to, we understand what we're belonging to and what that belief means. Uh, Pastor Larry mentioned this next week that you can, you can even believe in Jesus that's not enough. Even the demons believe in Jesus, the book of James says. We have to then take the next step and do what he says. And that's where that behave thing comes in. We're not about just uh, being a people who go, okay, yeah, you know what? We're just going to get together and whatever goes. No, we want to be a people that passionately pursue God's word, that listen to what he says, listen to the voice of the spirit to change us, to make us new. We want to grow together. We want to pursue holiness, to be holy as God is holy. But we do that in community with each other because one of the things that God told us to do was join together as the body, to be connected, to join together in relationship with one another. Have you uh, noticed, maybe it's just me, that we're living in somewhat of a vol volatile time? Does it seem that way? Kind of just, not here, we're good, you guys are great. Out there, right? Like in, in the world, it seems like a volatile time that things are blowing up, people are getting really angry. Uh, maybe it's always been like that, but it's very visible right now. Does it seem that way? Uh, this is my little social commentary. I think I know the problem. Okay, I think I got the problem. I think the problem is this. I think that right now for a variety of reasons, social media and 24 hour news networks and YouTube comment sections and Twitter, whatever it, it might be, we have the opportunity to contact others without having a relationship. That there, there can be communication with no understanding. Uh, a, a connection without connection, right? We, we have a touch with, to other people, but no relationship. And when we have contact, but no relationship, the worst of humanity comes out, right? We, uh, we, we say things about people that we would never say to people, right? Uh, we, we write things, or they write, let's talk about them. You guys are great. It's them out there. They write things in, in you know, comment sections and, and, and Twitter comments that they would never say to somebody face to face because there's no relationship. And, and so we fought, read an article and, and we're connected to it, but we have no context, no relationship to the understanding of what's going on in that person's life. What was their motivation? All we have are sound bites and snippets and boom, we light the fuse and blow it up and, and just kind of make it about uh, just uh, conflict and contrast. Now, I'm not here to try to solve the problems of the world. That's probably too much for the next 10 minutes. But I, am, I want to say this. We cannot let that happen to the church. Because right now we're at a place where it could go that way, right? If you're watching us on Facebook, awesome. I don't want to dis, uh, you know, downgrade. Pastor Steve's probably watching on Facebook right now. So, Pastor, we're glad that you're watching with us. Uh, but what I'm saying is we, we have the opportunity right now. We could, if we wanted to, maybe just sneak in the back row, sneak back out, and never really connect to this place. But that's not how it's supposed to be. That connection with no relationship brings out the 
negative in people. But when we connect in relationship, God works between us, in us, through us. God love abounds in us as we sharpen each other, as we build one another up, as we serve one another, as we ask, how are you? How can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? We have understanding for each other. And, and understanding no matter where somebody is or where they're coming from because relationship fosters understanding. We need to be very careful that we as a church continue to value embracing. So there's one last thing I want to talk about here as we uh, close today, and it's something I haven't really mentioned that maybe you thought of already, and that's this complicating uh, factor. People are difficult. Are they kind of difficult, right? It's not easy for everybody to just go, hey, everybody, connect with one another, love one another, and, you know, just be all serving one another. Amen. Good day. And you walk out here and go, wait a minute. I've had problems with this in the past, right? A lot of people have been hurt by church. Maybe you've been hurt by church. And I understand that when we say I've been hurt by church, you're not meaning that you slammed your finger in the church door or spilled too hot church coffee on your lap, right? That's not hurt by church. What you mean is I was hurt by somebody, right? Someone hurt me. There, there was a difficult thing. And this idea of connecting with one another isn't always easy. So I want, I want to offer to us three ways that we can effectively connect in relationship with one another as the church. Number one is to love them as Christ loved you. To love them as Christ loved you. How did Christ love you? He loved you without expecting anything in return. He poured himself out for you before getting anything back from you and with the expectation that he may never get anything back from you. That's how Jesus asks us to love one another. That's difficult, but the more we do it, the better it becomes because we see that's the most fulfilling way to love people. To not expect them to fulfill us, but to pour out our love, uh, the love that God gives us to others and expect God to fill us up in return. We're doing this series on Wednesday night uh, called Fruitful Marriage. Rebecca and I are leading this marriage Bible study. and We're watching a video uh, called What Happy Couples Know. And the first two weeks were over the idea, this is what happy couples know. Happy couples give love without expecting anything back in return. That love isn't offered with an expectation in return. Because when you love somebody with an expectation in return, that becomes a transactional relationship. And transactional relationships are unfulfilling relationships, right? Uh, if you uh, expect, hey, I'm going to love you, but I better get this back in return, you're probably going to be disappointed that you don't get it back in return. And even if you do, all it does is make it enough. All it does is meet your expectation, bring it back to zero. But if we love like Christ loved us, that I'm going to love you without expecting anything in return, we are fulfilled. Jesus told us a story to reinforce the importance of this. Remember this story in the Bible. He said, think about a man who was forgiven a debt of billions of dollars, billions of dollars. He couldn't repay it. And the man, the master who he owed it to said, just forget about it. I'm just going to forgive it. Go. No big deal. Don't worry. You don't owe it anymore. Man goes away so happy, but on the road, on the way home, sees another guy who owes him a few bucks. And he says, hey, where's my money? The man can't pay it. So he goes, you're going to jail. We're going to throw you in debtor's prison until you can pay me that money. Jesus says, how silly is that? Come on. That's not how I taught you to love. I showed you so much love. Love others the way I've loved you. Because as much as it, they might wrong you, it's nothing compared to what he's forgiven to us. The second thing is understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who changes people, not you and not me. See, it can be easy to kind of get caught up on, on how people are living, what they're doing and going, oh man, I just, I can't love that person because of how they're acting. Now we need to act in love and, and show correction to people, speak truth to people. That's loving. But we need to remember that it's the Holy Spirit that's going to change them. And when we grasp that idea, it does two things. First, it makes nobody out of the reach of God. Because if it's me that's going to change people, Guess what? 95% of those people are out of luck. I'm going to go, boy, sorry, looks like you're doomed to hell because there's no way I can change you, right? Because I can't. I don't have the power to do that. I might be able to help a couple of people, but, but I can't change most of those people. So I got to write them off going, so they're too far gone. That person's too far gone. But when I remember it's the Holy Spirit who changes people, 
no one is out of his reach because with God, anything is possible. So the second thing that we do when we grasp that idea is we pray fiercely for people. We pray like it all does depend on us because if it's God who's gonna change people, what's our role? Our role is to intercede for them, to appeal to God, say, God changed my brother. God changed my son. God changed my neighbor. God opened his heart, opened his mind, opened his thoughts, tear away what the enemy's trying to put into his path. And when we start praying for others, something miraculous happens to us. And if you've prayed for somebody on a regular basis, you've seen this, we get changed. Our attitude toward them changes. That resentment and bitterness and division that we used to feel starts to melt away and we start to feel the heart of God toward people. We start to feel like, I see why God loves them because they, he has a plan and a purpose for their life. And the third way that we can uh, effectively connect with people in relationship, be the body of Christ together, is to care about people at every stage of their spiritual journey. That means that we're aware of, of people who are just discovering who Jesus is, and we don't expect them to act like a board member of the church. Uh, we don't expect them to act like somebody who's been a disciple for decades. We care about them where they are and lovingly help them to the next step. And we care about people at the next step and lovingly help them to the next step. And we're aware of the step that we're on and allow others be teachable to help grow us and mature us. Because that's what we're doing, church. We are an embracing church that loves each other enough to grow one another, to walk with one another, to connect in relationship with one another and say, how are you? How can I pray for you? What kind of struggles are you going through right now that I could help lift you up? That we care about people on every stage of the journey. I'm so glad to be a part of Eastridge Church. Are you? Eastridge is an awesome church. I love to be a part of an embracing church, a place where I can invite a friend, a neighbor, and know that they'll be welcomed, a place where I know that people express and share the love of Jesus because in this house, we embrace. And West Seattle, I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Craig here in just a moment. Uh, but let me just close us here in prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your power. Thank you that you've given us the ability to be a connected body, to be a place where your love flows. And God, I pray that you would help us to do it in a way that honors you in Jesus' name. Amen.